This is Fifth Avenue. This used to be the stylish avenue in the world. This is where I got a lot of my concepts about colors of clothes. Just seeing people wearing them, men and women with different type of colors on that you never think would work. And my tailor was one block from here, 57 and 6. So I've always liked style. I like creating, I always like unusual colors, mixing colors that some people think would never match. When I first came to New York, I didn't know how to dress. I used to copy, you know, what people were wearing. From college, I used to wear penny loafers and button-down collar shirts, kind of Ivy League. In those days, our idols were Temptation, Four Tops, Smokey Robinson. So when these guys performed, they wore suit and ties. So everybody on the team, when I came, they, that's how they used to dress, man, for the game. So they were always competing to see who could outdress the other guy. So I started going, getting my suits made where these guys made their suits and stuff. And as a rookie, I, I wasn't playing good. So in order to pacify myself, I always went shopping. You know, I go out, go back to my room, dress up, and look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm not playing good, but I still look good. <laughs> so one day I bought this wide brim hat. And at the time, they were wearing the narrow brim. So the first time I wore the hat, everybody laughed at me. My teammates, guys on the other team. So as fate would have it, two weeks later, the movie, Bonnie and Clyde, comes out. So I walk in the locker room, everybody go, hey, look at Clyde. So that's how my nickname started. Uh, what made you decide to uh, get a fur coat? Well, it seems to be the end thing right now. Furs are very prominent. You know, I guess it started with Joe Namath, and then a lot of guys have uh, started buying furs. They're not only for women, I think the men can dig them too. You know, I used to wear my mink coats everywhere. I wore, you know, I have a white one, I have a black one, I have a raccoon, I had an otter. I had like four different fur coats. So I, I wear them anywhere. I, on the subway. Sometimes I used to take the subway, probably like this, a snowy day, real cold day. I didn't want to drive the car. So I just take the easy way, hop on the train. Obviously, I got a lot of looks. A guy on the train with a mink coat on, big wide brim hat. <laughs> People were yelling at me. But when I'm on the train, I didn't look at anybody. So I was like a typical New Yorker. I just looked down at the floor. So, because the thing is, if you make eye contact with people, they get confidence and come over and say, are you Frazier, are you Frazier? All right, all right. I don't know how to get your doubt, I'm sorry. Who else could it be but Clyde? Come on, man. Come on, man. So the Clyde image came from the hat. And around that time, I was also starting to play better. You know, I was starting to see more action. And that's when it all hit at the same time. So I was dressing good before I was recognized as a good dresser. The fans, I never knew how popular I was until I went out and like I would go to church and I walk into church and people start screaming. And I was like, what are they doing? You know, I go to parties and people were just running up to me, wanting an autograph. People want to take pictures with me. At the garden, they used to have a lot of concerts. One night I went to a Stevie Wonder concert and I was waiting for the elevator, man, and, and people just engulfed me. <laughs> you know, they were like, oh, there's Clyde, man, and they just started coming and coming, and you know, the guards couldn't keep them off of me. And I, I realized at that point, I go, wow, wow, man, I'm, I'm a big time celebrity now, you know? And then once I bought the Rolls Royce, you know, that was it, man. I couldn't go anywhere. Like, I come out of Small's Paradise. I come out, man, there'd be numbers all over the windshield. <laughs> Women be leaving their phone numbers all over the windshield for me, man. It was, you know, I'd never experienced anything like that before. It was exciting, but I, I had to realize why I was in New York, man. There was a lot of temptation. My job was to play, to be a good player. So I always set a curfew at 4 o'clock, man. I'm headed home. I'm happy I'm not playing today because if they had uh, social media, I would have never been able to be Clyde, man. The coach would have known everywhere I was hanging out, right? If you say let's, I would say go, man. I go to Queens every night I went out. Whatever place was hot, man, I was there. The Regines, that was a the place. Then Studio 54 came in. You know, that was the place to be. I like the disco with the lights. 
you know, flashing of the lights and all of that. Studio 54, man. This was the place. There'd be hundreds of people waiting to get in. You know, like when I drive over with my car, be fighting my way through the crowd. Girls be saying, Clyde, take me in, take me in. Any celebrity that ever come to New York, they're going to be here. Like do impromptu appearances, hopping up on stage, just singing. Mick Jagger, Teddy Pendergrass, a lot of different people, man. It was such a fun place to be. The light show was the thing, though, especially at 12 o'clock. They had the, the moon come down like a crescent moon getting high. <laughs> it was like, it was a scene. After the game, you could find the roads parked outside. You know, I was hanging out, having a good time because we were winning. <clears throat> the thing is, when I was losing, I never, you never see me out when I'm losing. The music doesn't sound as good. The food doesn't taste as good. So I'm not hanging out when, when the team is not winning. But luckily for like five or six years, we were winning all the time. You know, like, I've been working for the Knicks for 25 years, and when I go to the games, I'm oblivious that my number is hanging in the rafters. But every night I come out here after the game, I think of the twilight of my career. I wasn't playing that good, the team wasn't winning, but there'd always be a group of kids out here waiting for me. Four or five kids saying, Clyde, you're still the greatest. Clyde, you get it the next time. Clyde, let me carry your bags. So I, I've never forgotten that. You know, the memories abound when I come out and I think of that, that the kids were always supportive, even in, in the bad times. They were always there, so. My personality has changed uh, dramatically. I'm more laid back. Actually, I've gone 360. I've gone from this quiet, shy guy who came to New York, developed this Clyde image, used to be a man about town. Now I've reverted back to Walt, a guy who rarely goes out, trying to be in a position at 70 years old that if I want to retire, I could retire or I could continue working. When I go somewhere, I don't think I'm the, the center of attention anymore. So I'm, I'm surprised when people make a fuss over me, show me a lot of respect as though I'm still, still playing the game. And I think there's a blessing in disguise because like a lot of players today don't realize the image that you project when you're playing is going to be the one that people have of you when you retire. So the image that people have of me was I was always a good guy, I took time to talk to them. You know, I would sign autographs, I related to the kids. Not only myself, my entire team, Bradley, DeBusher, Reed, Barnett. So this is the image that we have and how we played the game. I think that's the essence of now what I'm still trying to do that I'm, I hold myself as a positive role model. When I walk the streets of New York, man, I'm so humbled the respect and admiration that people show me. Black and white people that come in there supporting me, young and old. You know, I'd be an ingrate not to give back, man, to, to the people. If you come to Madison Square Garden, there's one autograph you're guaranteed to get. It's Walt Frazier's. I always take time to take pictures, sign autographs. I feel older to the fans.